but for neurodivergent kids, what happens is that the 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 things you you breaking down a word into such tiny pieces, they can't relate to it. Today's masterclass is on helping creative, imaginative people overcome dyslexia. Our guest today is my dear friend Olive Hickmott, a forensic health and learning coach specializing in working with neurodivergent students. Twenty-two years ago, Olive started empowering learning. Being dyslexic and ADHD herself, she discovered, with the help of neuroscience, how to simplify literacy, numeracy, and concentration, developing the skills for herself and others. She is proud of her international network of trained practitioners. Welcome, Olive. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me along. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So what is neurodivergent for anyone that's listening and doesn't know? Um, yeah, there's, over the years, there's been a lot of different names and people have been identified as dyslexic or dyspraxic or ADHD or autistic. And then somebody invented the title of neurodiversity. And I quite like neurodiversity because it's... Um, it's two things. It's firstly is it's a broad spectrum for everybody. And secondly, it is about the fact that we all probably think differently. And so neurodiversity means we've got a hot in the world. We have a neurodiverse population, loads of people thinking differently. And some of them, which they now call neurotypical, are the kids that do really well in school because they're learning exactly the same way as they're being taught. The neurodivergent kids are struggling with the way they're being taught because it doesn't match the way they naturally learn. And so that's, and also, so that's the big thing about it. And the second thing is it gives you space for saying these neurodivergent people have got great skills. And so don't put them down as having learning difficulties. They, they just learn differently. And we've done a lot of work on looking at how um, the strengths of people who are neurodivergent. And there is amazing strengths. That's, that's incredible. And I'd have to agree with that. As you know, I've worked alongside you and I'm dyslexic myself. So for anyone that is listening and doesn't know what dyslexia is, could you just explain that? Um, the definition is that bright people who struggle with um, sp um, literacy, basically, who struggle with spelling and reading. You get now, you get some people who are really good at reading and really dreadful at spelling. And you get, I get parents say to me, how can I get my child read that word? And two minutes later, they can't spell it. This is ridiculous, but there is a, there is a neuroscience reason for this. Um, and so, uh, the dyslexics, and as they grow up, they tend to get different sorts of symptoms. Like, for example, if you're really struggling to read and you're struggling to write, then you do things like you put, you get a bit disorganized and you put to the bottom of the pile the things you don't want to do. So people say you can't concentrate. Well, actually, you can concentrate really hard on some things you want to do, but you don't want to concentrate on the things that bring you grief. I, I can relate to that, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, definitely. How do you change the way students think about dyslexia? I always talk about strengths and they're always amazed. You know, somebody will walk in here and they're with their mum and I'll start saying to them, OK, so what do you like doing? Now, in the past, they've gone along to an assessor who's probably said, one of their first questions is, what doesn't work? You know, what's what's your problem? It's like going to the doctor. What's your problem? Well, I go and say, what are you really good at? And then I have a long conversation, five or ten minutes, about what they're really good at and how they do what they do really well. So, for example, I had 
the Hertfordshire under something or other, 12, I think it was, chess champion uh, came to see me. Couldn't spell for toffees, um, but clearly was extremely good at chess. And so I, when he walked in here, I said to him, okay, so what do you, um, how do you do chess? And he went, well, I just play it. And I go, okay, tell me a bit more about it. Can you see what your move is going to be and then what the other guy's move is going to be and then what your move is going to be? He said, oh, yes, I do that all the time. That's the great, one of the great skills to be able to visualize really well and be able to visualize as a movie. That's one of the great skills. That's why there's so many dyslexics in uh, film. Yes, definitely. Steven Spielberg. Yep. (laughs) Oh, that's really great. What happens to children as they grow up? Take me through the cycle. Well, they get into school at the age of four, and some of them have learnt a bit of literacy before they get there with mum and dad. Some of them haven't. And... They are taught uh, phonics in school, which is um, breaking the words down into small pieces and putting them back together again and then pronouncing them, which is all very well um, for neurotypical kids and works really well. But for neurodivergent kids, what happens is that the the, the things you, you're breaking down a word into such tiny pieces, they can't relate to it. If, for example, you in the old days when we you just used um, syllables, we used to say football, and so we think of the word foot and think of the word ball. If you if you um, realise both of those are object words, so they really mean something to neurodivergent people who've got great abilities to visualise. So, what you do, what happens with breaking bits words down into little pieces is they become meaningless to some kids and that's where the problem happens and of course what happens next is they start falling behind their peers Um, by the time they leave primary school which in the UK is at 11 um, they may well have got a reading age of a five or six year old still I've met several who are in year six which is the last year in primary who just couldn't read at all And we taught them how to do what I'm going to tell you about. And lo and behold, they could read. Um, And then, of course, you get into other kids taking the rise out of them or teachers saying some rather unfortunate things occasionally. And when they get into secondary school, you're into bullying Mm -hmm. and all things like that. And, of course, we put huge amounts of effort into bullying in, in schools, but we don't we don't put the same amount of effort into how does a child stop being dyslexic, which is what I teach people, the skills that they've missed out in school. And then you go through life as an adult and some kids and some adults are traumatized by all of this. Some I've heard so many horror stories from our adults about what going to school was like, um, that it's a miracle they've ever come out in one piece at all, to be honest. And um, there was a debate in the House of Commons quite recently, which I listened to, on um, mental health. And a number of the people, um, the number of the MPs were saying how bad the mental health is with um, it, the situation at the moment. And, of course, COVID's made it worse. Mm-hmm. And um, But also how quite some of these children that have got mental health issues have actually got appalling literacy. So if you can imagine how much anxiety they go through on a daily basis going into school, not being able to read or spell well, and they are they re-traumatise themselves every day. So that's how it goes. And I, it took me until I was, what was I, 50, before I discovered how good spellers spelt. And mm-hmm. I was furious. And so that's typically what happens to people. Some people take it on as a challenge. I'm going to fix this. Other people go, I can't be bothered. Um, I'm, I, I, it, it has been, there's too many bad memories around it. But that's just up to you. When, but my attitude is I'll teach people the how-tos. 
that's really great because here's the thing being dyslexic we've got a higher iq so there's nothing about being below par yeah absolutely and all the bullying i can relate there are so much that goes on in schools and they're not looking at um definitely the mindset and that's the work i do helping with the mindset you've got to be able to see what works for you like you said and go yeah. with your strengths there's no other way yeah how did neuroscience help you um the great thing was i found out on a training course um that good spellers see words in their and good spellers and readers see words in their imagination and let me just digress onto that for a moment is if you can picture a teddy bear for example and you can see and you can picture it in your mind's eye some people have incredible pictures some people have just vague pictures of their favorite teddy bear and if you just notice what the teddy bear is wearing or something about the teddy bear then um, I'll have my one joining in in a minute. The um, <laughs> and um, so you've got you've got we know you've got pictures in your head, and most neurodivergent students have actually got really good pictures in their head. So we just started superimposing words on the pictures. So if you want to spell a word like giraffe, which is pretty tricky, tricky, if you can look up into your visual field and see the word giraffe, which by the way is spelt with one R and two Fs, because most people don't know, um, then you can spell the word giraffe. So that's what, I discovered that in a piece, in a training course in 10 minutes. And I walked into my local special needs school and I said, can I borrow some of your kids? And because I think I've just learned something that might help them. If you've got anybody that can't spell and they said, I've got, we've got hundreds, which ones do you want? <laughs> and so I did some work there. And so I, from a practical point of view and a coaching point of view, I knew what was going on. Then I discovered in the, um, around 2000, sorry, there was research done in the 1990s, but around 2000, the neuroscientists turned up and found out the actual exact piece of the brain where you store words. Stanislav Lehane in uh, Paris discovered it and Sally Shaywitz in the US also promoted it. So we knew what the neuroscience was doing and that made it, you know, we didn't need any more research to be quite honest because we knew practically how to help kids change it and we knew what the, the neuros, it was all founded on the neuroscience. And so it was a great benefit to me because it, doing a neuroscience project is really expensive. Um, and it was a great benefit to be, have someone tell me this is what is going on when somebody reads a word and when somebody spells a word with people that are really good at it. So all we had to do was to learn how to teach people who weren't very good at it, which was much easier job. Sounds really interesting. So what can you do now with that? Well, we just teach people how to visualize words. Mm -hmm. And it means what, ha what happens is once you can visualize words and for anybody listening, some of you might f be already visualizing words because you find literacy easy. Some of you may be so good at literacy that you don't realize you're visualizing words. So I always ask people like that to, um, spell the word conscientious because normally it's because they start off C O N S C I E N T. Oh yes, I did see it. I saw it up there, you know. So if they're really good, they won't realize that they're doing it. Um, if, um, and then a lot of people know that's what they're doing. And I always give them a question, which is, so if you can visualize words, what would it like be like for you to spell and read if that technique was taken away? And most people will sit there with their mouths open and go, it would be impossible. And I said, that's what dyslexics mm. are doing. They've never had it, so they've never, nobody's taken it away, but they've never got it. And we're not teaching it in school, which I think personally is a great mistake for four-year-olds. It should be taught in parallel. It's not instead of phonics, it's in parallel with phonics. 
So you, you learn how to break down the word. And once you've seen it a couple of times, you visualize the word. So it's not one or the other, which the reading wars um, promoted back in the day. It's both. You need both. And that's what we do. We teach people. And typically, um, I've got this network of coaches around the world, um, some of whom are teachers, some of whom are educationalists, some of whom are just mums who learnt the skill for their own kids. Mm. Um, so typically, if I'm working with a child, I will do three classes only. I will The first class, I'll get them to make friends with their mental images so that they've got them under control and start to visualise noun words. Then we start to visualise non-noun words and we do a bit of maths as well because for maths you have to visualise numbers. Mm -hmm. I have a maths degree. I couldn't have got my maths degree without visualising numbers, I can tell you. Um, and then we do a wrap-up with other things like comprehension and stuff like that. And so things like anxiety go down dramatically because... Mm -hmm. Kids turn around to you and say, oh, I can do that. I didn't know I was meant to be doing that. Mm. And so with a bit of practice, because they've missed out on practice, so with a bit of practice, they can be fluently. I mean, I, I have one child I remember who was, they were twins. And so mama got this double whammy with these two of them, both diagnosed dyslexic, came to see me at the beginning of the summer holidays I taught them how to do this. They practiced all during the summer holidays in a fun sort of way. Um, for example, when they went to, they went up to Edinburgh at one time because she was Scottish and they, um, when they were in the airport, they looked at all the signs and they, they just learned how to read those. By the time they got to the first week of term in September, they were running into school on a spelling test day. They loved it. <laughs> And they weren't making mistakes. But those two, you know, that is just typical of mm -hmm. the clients I see. Mainly diagnosed, but you don't have to be. If you're just struggling with literacy, do this before you get a diagnosis, in my opinion, because you might avoid all of that. And it's very positive rather than a diagnosis tends to be really negative. It's like it's all about what you can't do. Mm. That's great the way you're um, teaching. It's, you know, a shame they're not doing that in schools. So why aren't they teaching mental imagery in schools? Because the government um, in about 15 years ago said you must teach phonics. And then uh, later on they said you must teach phonics only. And I have a letter from, I think it was Nick Gibb, who was schools minister at the time, that said, because I wrote in via my MP and said, why aren't we teaching this in primary school? Mm -hmm. And um, he wrote back, and I have, still have the letter. It says, um, we, we let teachers teach in any way that they think is the most appropriate. That was the first paragraph. So I thought, yes, I'm winning here. The second paragraph was, and you will only teach phonics <laughs> with a big only. Um, for literacy. You can do anything else how you like, but not literacy. And um, I was appalled. I've never managed to get any sensible discussion with the government on this. I would love to, if somebody listens to this and knows how I can do it, um, I would love to, because it is such a simple skill to teach, it almost beggars belief. Yeah. And we shouldn't be, um, there is no reason why anybody can't visualize. Um, some people think they can't visualize, but, and there is something called aphantasia, but that is very, very rare. Mm -hmm. But if you just think about a small child coming out of school, do they recognize their own parents? If they do, they've got mental images in their head. And if mum turns up wearing a pink curly wig, they might cry or they might go to the wrong mum or whatever, but they, they've they already got pictures in their head. So I would like every reception year to be running phonics in parallel with mental imagery. 
and you will i've had i've had teachers say to me i remember one teacher who said do you know i've 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 integrated the two together so well that probably nobody would notice what how i'm teaching but it's working really well i can't work out whether i've got a really good year this year or whether this is the critical thing that's made the difference she said i'll probably never know but they are astounding my year this year and things like their confidence grows mm. you know because they they're succeeding of course their confidence mm. is going to grow yes that explain like that it's simple why wouldn't you use it exactly why wouldn't you mm. very good expression mm -hmm. Who is your ideal student? Um, creative, imaginative kids. Kids preferably. Um, it's easier than with adults, mm. I have to say, because adults tend to get so many reasons why they can't do it and stressed about it, and it's gonna re they're going to relive previous um, bad experiences in school. So preferably um, small children. But I can, I'm just, I mean, my oldest client was 80. And um, so, and he was amazing. He learned in about 10 minutes how to do it. Wow. It, <laughs> it was like, oh, it was just like lighting the blue touch paper with him. Um, so anybody, but you've got to be open-minded to try mm. something different. And you've got to be prepared to practice because if you haven't been, using this skill since you were four, then you need to practice it. And I always, that's why I do three sessions with people and I have a gap between each so they can go away and do lots of practice. What would you like to achieve now? Because I already know you're an author. Um, I've worked alongside you. I've got a <laughs> handful of your books here. I've got your programs here too. So you're You've done marvellous things. So what would you like to achieve now? I'd like this to be adopted in education, mm -hmm. in the English-speaking world, because if you're learning a phonetic language, oh, by the way, in, I didn't tell you that English is not a perfectly phonetic language, despite the fact they're teaching phonics only. Mm -hmm. Whereas Italian, for example, is a pretty perfect phonetic language. So what you hear is what you write. That isn't true in English. Um, you know, phone should be spelled F-O-N-E or F-O-N if you like. Um, the, um, so what I'd like to achieve is this is taught in the English speaking world in parallel to phonics. Simple question. Why don't we? Yeah. And, and why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. What resources do you recommend, tools, daily um, steps to anyone who is dyslexic? Um, just the first thing to do is if you, if somebody is dyslexic, is ask them if they're visualizing words. And if they're not visualizing words, you know, can they, when they go to spell a word like also, for example, can they see it? If they can't, then get them to have a look at my website, which is empoweringlearning.co.uk and just have a wander around my website and just see what um, registers with you. Alternatively, go to um, some of my free YouTubes that I did during lockdown. There's loads of success stories up there and you can find them. Yes, empoweringlearning.co.uk mm -hmm. is the best thing to look at. and um, you're always very welcome to contact me. I'm olive at empoweringlearning.co.uk. And where can the listeners get hold of your books? Will they be able to do that they're on all, your website? or They're all on Amazon and they're all on my website as well. Okay. And my training courses. Mm -hmm. And I'm now starting to put together a set of online training, which doesn't engage me, if you like, so that it doesn't get lost in time. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's going to be put, that's being put up on one of the learning platforms so that people will be able to access it. And there will be loads of free stuff up there already. And if you go to Empowering Learning, you'll find the link to 
all the stuff that's going up there. Thank you very much for sharing your deep, insightful wisdom and knowledge with us today, Olive Hickmore. Our pleasure. So what is one of the most courageous things you have done? Because I know you've done a lot of things. So what would you say one of the most courageous things you have done is? Uh, I think taking on the education system is courageous. It might be mm. foolhardy. And it's frustrating and exhausting. And, um, but it's so worthwhile. I will never stop doing it. Um, if, you know, I need all the help I can get to get this message through, mm -hmm. but I'll never give up on it because it's just, it's too important for our children. And just let me just back up a minute. These are bright, creative mm. kids. And we are telling them there's something wrong with them. This is not acceptable to me. We've got bright, creative kids who can solve some of the horrendous problems this world is dealing with at the moment. And they're not getting past primary school in an open and, you know, effective way. Mm -hmm. And so I would always say let's, I mean, that is, definitely a courageous thing to do but it's also really difficult i couldn't agree with you more what is your definition of courage oh wow um the word foolhardy comes to <laughs> comes to mind <laughs> the um i was very ill at one time mm -hmm. and I nearly left the planet with a burst appendix, mm -hmm. which was undiagnosed for days. And I think it's made me much more courageous. It's like, oh, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. I've got over that one. And so I think um, go for what you really want to do. And you may succeed, you may not succeed, but at least you won't have given up trying. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you ever so much. Olive Hickmont.